Hey everyone, this is Patrick. Thank you for tuning into this week's episode of the Wealth Standard Podcast, where we are discussing the theme of entrepreneurship. I hope you have enjoyed and learned a lot from this season's the number of guests that we've had this season talking on a variety of topics. It I, I definitely have learned a lot, and today it's no exception. This is an individual that I. Uh, when I saw him scheduled as a as a guest, I was really excited. It's someone that I have followed uh, for quite some time, and I believe you are going to learn a, a lot from him. So I'm going to introduce him first, then talk about what I what I wanted to get out of the interview, what I was uh, trying to um, learn from from him, and I'm hoping that you also are going to learn the the same thing, potentially something different. Um, so I'll discuss that in a second. But my guest, his name is uh, Dr. Richard Ron. He, he is currently currently the chairman of the Institute for Global Economic Growth, and was the former is the former economic advisor to uh, President George H. W. Bush and uh, vice president and chief economist of the United States Chamber of Commerce during the Reagan administration. Uh, he's also a former senior fellow at the Cato Institute, and he is uh, currently. Uh, consulting, writing for the Washington Times, but all of the links to follow Richard, learn more about his work, you can go to uh, thewellstandard.com and in the show notes, we have it all there. Now, I actually met Dr. Ron uh, almost 10 years ago in uh, the country of Belize. Uh, I was down there visiting a real estate development of some strategic uh, partners and he happened to be down there as well, advising the Belizean government. And so we were able to, uh, the group I was with was able to coordinate a dinner with Dr. Ron. And I still think about that dinner and some of the things that were discussed uh, in relation to uh, Dr. Ron's uh, involvement, not just in what Belize was doing, but also a lot of other countries, especially uh, in the uh, former Soviet Union, helping to consult with uh, establishing the infrastructure for those uh, countries to uh, to thrive. And and I didn't necessarily, I didn't know what I didn't know. And back then that conversation really sparked some ideas in my mind. And, and I thought about him um, and just developed more and more respect and admiration for what he has uh, done with his career. He's consulted with numerous governments and has truly made a, made a difference and that's what we get into today. And now the reason why I wanted to to bring him on, and what I'm hoping you all gain from this, is you know, in understanding this this role of an entrepreneur uh, and the nature of the structure in which they operate. I you know I've come to realize that there are there are these entrepreneurial uh, instincts uh, in in most human in beings, maybe all human beings. I don't know, uh, but I look at the how vital the environment is. And Dr. Ron goes into what I would say the hierarchy of the uh, the structure of economies, the structure of societies, in order for the entrepreneur to thrive. If not, they're gonna they're gonna leave, and the growth of these specific uh, economies or societies will be will be stifled without the structure. And it was it was fascinating. And the reason why I wanted to you know have him talk about certain things was I believe today there isn't necessarily a respect. Uh, for the structure, because nobody, you know, I would say, especially in the United States, very few people have actually um, experienced the other side of the spectrum or the lack of a structure in which their entrepreneurial sp- uh, uh, pursuits could take take root and take hold and, and grow. And I'd say today in our day and age, you, you find that there are, there's a lot of divisiveness with regards to political stances and perspective. And this divisiveness, I believe, is creating camps and people are joining camps or aligning with camps without really understanding the fundamental reasons, uh, you know, behind certain stances on economy. It's more, you know, that this person believes this way. Therefore, I'm not going to give any regard to the structure in which they believe or what they are advocating as a, the, the right, you know, political or economic environment because they have this name or wear this hat or wear this label. I'm not. I'm going to completely discount them. I think that's where where we are as an American society is we've joined these camps more off of uh, emotion than off of actually reason and logic. And I look at going forward and how amazingly entrepreneurial the United States is. And and I you know I would say for those of you listening, you as entrepreneurs, 
is to be able to have an understanding of all sides of the spectrum when it comes to the appropriate structure, the economic environment, the political environment, uh, the monetary environment, so that we can defend based on principle instead of defend based on rhetoric and talking points. And 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 that's where I believe most people are are at. Now, I I look at this conversation as um, someone who has experienced uh, the uh, pros, the successes of certain structure, structured uh, economies and societies, as well as uh, the failures. And I think that uh, within you know the failure side of things, you really learn a lot about what works and what doesn't. And so I know we didn't have a ton of time, but as I researched the uh, this interview and 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 watched videos and read articles, especially in the Washington Times, where he talks uh, almost every week about these topics. I I really uh, just kind of gained a admiration for how he looks at things and what he's saying, and so it's uh, it's awesome. I think you guys are going to learn a lot from the podcast, but also learn a lot if you uh, follow Richard and what he is up to. Now, if you're listening for the first time, we did a, a several months on the theme of entrepreneurship. Uh, previous to that, we did a, a four months on capitalism uh, in 2018. We did seasons on the uh, idea of, of life, liberty, and property as it pertains to one of the more famous uh, quotes and points of uh, the uh, John Locke, who is a, a British uh, philosopher. And, and so if you, if you like what you're hearing now, definitely go back and uh, listen to those. We'd love your feedback on the podcast. Uh, if you guys want to give us some review, good reviews on uh, iTunes, that would definitely help. <clears throat> Share the episode with your uh, friends and family, that'd be amazing. You guys are you guys are awesome. Been so supportive and uh, grateful for that support. All right, so let's uh, let's go ahead and get to the interview with Dr. Richard Ron. Hey everyone, Patrick here. Listen, most of you know that I wrote a book last year called "Heads I Win, Tails You Lose: A Financial Strategy to Reignite the American Dream," and the book has has sold tens of thousands of copies. We're really excited about it. So for those of you who are new listening and haven't had your chance to pick one up, you guys can actually get it for free. So if you head over to thewealthstandard.com forward slash book, then all you have to do is pay for shipping and you will get your uh, copy for free. So head over to thewealthstandard.com forward slash book. Thanks for the support. Uh, Richard, it's it's awesome to have uh, have you on. It's it's something I've been looking forward to for quite uh, some time now. We met uh, a couple of, uh, well, lo- a little more than a couple of years ago, but I've been intrigued with the work that you've done. And I've been, like I said, looking forward to asking you some of these questions. So welcome, uh, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. Great to see you, be with you. So Richard, what, you know, the, the thing that has really kind of piqued my interest in regards to some conversations we've had had in the past is in relation to the perspective you have on successful and unsuccessful economic environments, why they, why certain societies succeed, why, why certain societies fail. So what do, you know, maybe to start out by, uh, by telling the audience or teaching the audience some of the reasons, maybe the universal reasons for uh, these outcomes. Well, it's, it's interesting when you mention universal reasons, because it is indeed true that if you look at successful countries, You find them over the globe, and you find countries that are failures over the globe. And it has nothing to do with nationality or um, climate or where they're located on the globe. It has all to do with fundamental policy. And we have great success stories, of course, not only the U.S., but Switzerland, Singapore, even Ireland now, and uh, places that have very high incomes. And then you have places, well, Venezuela now is the poster child for a country that was rich, uh, has the world's largest oil resources, and now is at the bottom of economic freedom, and incomes have been rapidly dropping for a number of years, and so the place is impoverished just because of policy. But when you start off, the key policy is the rule of law. And without the rule of law, nothing else works. And a lot of us who are economists like to talk about taxes and regulations and so forth, monetary policy. But even though you have an ideal tax system, if you don't have the rule of law, it still won't work. And um, 
fortunately, the British, when they built the British Empire, there was a lot of downsides to that. But one thing they left around the world was um, the British legal system, the common law system. And many places it took and uh, worked very well. You know, each country adapted it somewhat to its own needs. And other places, it got corrupted and didn't work. Uh, you and I were in Belize a number of years ago. It's a prime example of a British territory that was given the rule of law and an honest court system, but they managed to corrupt it and destroy it, and the place remains poor. Uh, <clears throat> once you have the rule of law, you've got to have a competent and honest judiciary to carry it out. The importance of having honest and competent judges can't be understated. Then, of course, is free markets. And um, uh, you know, socialism just doesn't plain work. And we can do uh, many shows on why socialism doesn't work. <laughs> but the importance of having free markets, free trade, uh, taxes that are uh, low on work, saving, and investment, on capital and labor, and uh, don't unduly interfere with the uh, economic, uh, underlying economic goings on. And then reasonable regulations. Uh, many places, including the US, get overly regulated. There's a lot of unreasonable regulations. I noticed that a number of the uh, Democratic candidates right now want to take away my plastic straws. And I thought I might even do a little article on this of how. I don't like drinking through paper straws because it, slowly, it dissolves in your mouth before you have. And then some places have these aluminum straws, which are terrible because they're unsanitary, they break your teeth and other problems. But these are kind of a stupid little regulations, totally unneeded. And then having a, a sound money. And by that, you need a money which is basically a store of value good unit of account and uh, a means of transaction. And the dollar has been imperfect, but it's been far better than the other world fiat currencies ever since we got off the gold standard. And for all intents and purposes, the, world, the, the dollar is the world standard. And those are sort of the fundamentals. If you don't follow them, you're probably gonna be poor. If you do follow them, you're likely to be rich. And I'm talking about countries, but it's also true in people's private lives uh, people that are play by the rules are honest and work hard tend to do better than those who uh, try to find shortcuts. Usually, doesn't work out too well. Yeah, it's you know it's safe it's safe to say that I, you know in my experience, many people don't have the perspective that you do when it comes to other countries and what they face as the consequences of not following this. You know, I would I would say hierarchy of you know universal infrastructure and and that's where you look at a lot of the younger entrepreneurs that have built really successful businesses have become wealthy themselves uh, discount sometimes the that infrastructure and oftentimes uh, point to more socialistic type of structures to uh, you know essentially help those that are that they consider less less fortunate so how, why do you, do you consider that a slippery slope and, and, why, and why? Well, it's, it's, it's really naive. And, you know, a number of countries tried it. We, people often talk about Sweden, talk about being socialist. Sweden's not socialist. It had been for about a 30-year period. Sweden had been very capitalistic from about 1870. Um, until around the 1950s and 60s. Then the, uh, the, the social do-gooders took over and they nationalized a number of things, but they built really a welfare state. They didn't, they didn't go overboard with the nationalization. They didn't go as far as Britain did before Margaret Thatcher, uh, but it didn't work. And Sweden went from the fourth wealthiest country in the, in the world to something like 17th. And so the Swedes, it's been, I guess, almost 30 years ago now, began to reverse course. And Sweden is now much more capitalistic. I mean, they still have a big social safety net. But when you're there, 
virtually everything is privately owned. They have again the rule of law. Um, they're quite entrepreneurial. You can start your own business without problems. And um, again, they've got this uh, social welfare state, which works somewhat in small homogeneous economies. Uh, like in a place like Finland, which is very homogeneous, it works somewhat there. I mean, there's still the imperfections, but uh, it doesn't work in large heterogeneous economies. And uh, people think, oh, isn't this wonderful where everybody gets along and shares? <clears throat> but in reality, it's not what people actually do. And I always find uh, one thing is interesting a lot of the very wealthy people in the US who are sort of left leaning and, and talk about this thing are also the least uh, generous when it comes to private giving. And there was a wonderful book years ago by Arthur Brooks of who actually gives. And it turned out that there was much greater donations to good causes from a lot of the, uh, what are considered sort of the tough guy capitalists than the social liberals. And you know, the uh, people who you, you view as really the hard headed businessmen give enormous amounts of money to um, hospitals and you know, uh, the arts and all kinds of things. And, and that's a good way because particularly in today's society, when you get billions of dollars, I mean, it's got, uh, there's this sort of pack among a number of the billionaires to give away all the money because how much can any one person spend on themselves? Not that much. I mean, and I look at the Gates, um, Bill Gates dresses the same way we do. I mean, how, have you ever seen him in a suit? Well, I guess once in a while. <laughs> and, um, you know, he might have a, a bit nicer car. The one thing they have is a private jet. That's the one thing I have. Uh, <laughs> that I've uh, always sort of like. But for the most part, uh, anybody who's successful, they really can't eat more. And there's sort of a, a, a maximum size house you want. Uh, I had this my test of how far should the bathroom be from the master bed? <laughs> and um, because he had some of these houses were being built um, that the bathrooms were such a distance from the, um, the bedroom that you had quite a trek. And I noticed this has now shrunk back down to a reasonable thing because people, particularly as they get older, have to get up in the night or whatever, or kids. No, they don't want to walk 200 feet to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> so, but the point is, there's an optimum with all kinds of things. When a society becomes sufficiently wealthy, um, there's no sense in overdoing it anymore. And again, I, I was looked at Steve Jobs with a T-shirt. I mean, the billionaires in Silicon Valley are T-shirts, and they, you don't see. Uh, I mean, a few of them have a, a massive house, but a lot of them don't. And, um, you know, I live in a fairly affluent community in Northern Virginia, and we have a neighborhood pub. And I never know if the guy sitting at the next table is a billionaire or runs the neighborhood lawn service. And that's wonderful about the U.S. because it doesn't matter, and we're all there sort of together. And that's really true equality, where we all have a quality of opportunity, but not necessarily a result. Yeah, there's a there's a saying I heard a number of years ago that uh, the secret the secret to living is is giving, and you know I I, I was really intrigued when a local kind of a local billionaire to uh, to where I'm at uh, passed away a few years ago, uh, John Huntsman, and he had you know chem, a chemical company and he was kind of very you. entrepreneurial had a, a one, he founded one of the first uh, really renowned cancer uh, mm -hmm. cancer hospitals. And, and that's what he said in his uh, biographies. He talked about how he, he became wealthy because he just learned to, the, the satisfaction of giving at a very early time. And he realized that the more he grew, the more he could contribute and give. I think that's something that is very interesting when you look at, you know, like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and what they've uh, been able to accomplish. I, I had a, uh, it was a bit of a partner. He was also a senior partner, a guy named Bob Kriebel. Years ago, and Bob had invited, invented Superglue, the Loctite Corporation, yeah. and um, he was a great entrepreneur, but he spent most of the time giving away his money. 
And he used to drive a little Ford Escort around Washington. And he'd be up in his 80s and he'd scare me to death the way he drove. And I said to him one day, Bob, why don't you get yourself a bit bigger car? You can afford it, a little more iron. And he said, well, the more money I spend on myself, the less money I have to give away. And that was just his attitude. And I thought, that's such an American attitude. And I look at today where you have, you know, Bill, Bill Gates is a perfect example where, you know, he's, he's still involved to, to an extent, right? But for the most part, he's, he's giving. But the, what he, the impact he's made on the entire world based on his desire, you know, to, to grow, I mean, obviously his vision of having a computer at every, uh, at every home, you, you know, has really uh, blessed the world and benefited the world. And that's where I look at, it's interesting where you have this left-leaning uh, entrepreneurial crowd who, you know, in essence is, is wanting to delegate that responsibility to uh, government and to distribute uh, wealth through taxation and, you know, take care of those that are less fortunate. Uh, and I think that's a very, you know, f- uh, flawed philosophy uh, because, you know, the government really hasn't created much, if anything. It's the entrepreneur, it's the human being and and their uh, ability to whether it's creating, you know, things in industry or industries themselves that change the way in which people live. Because in order for them to be wealthy, they have to make uh, lives better for a lot of other people first. Yeah. In fact, I could argue that Bill, uh, that Steve Jobs actually has done, did more to increase the world's standard of living than any human beforehand. Because with the iPhone and iPad, I mean, there's, well, just of the Apple version, there's like a billion and a half out there, plus all these other versions. Virtually everybody on the planet now has it. And you look at the places in uh, poor areas of Africa, but they all have them. They now do their banking. You have a, a, a smartphone and you have all the world's knowledge in your hand. And things like medical care. I mean, things, so much of the stuff you can now self-treat. In fact, we know that uh, a typical American can come down with something. The first thing they do is go to WebMD to see you know, how serious it is or what they can self-treat before they have to go to the doctor. But you look at all the apps it takes care of, of it, things like cameras. And I've always traveled around the world a good deal when uh, this is the work I've done. And I used to take a camera with me and a Rolodex and all these kinds of things. And now I have everything in my hand all the time. And But even poor people around the world have this. And that has been enormously empowering and greatly reduced uh, mortality rates and increased the uh, stock of happiness for people. People now know where they, if they have a shortage of something, immediately they know what the world markets are and where surpluses of things are, where shortages are. And the markets can arbitrage that over the globe instantaneously. And it's, it's a wonderful innovation that people haven't really thought through of it. That's one reason we have this apparent worldwide deflation is that the improvements in technology have been so fast that they've, in certain ways, overwhelmed the ability of the government to inflate the currency, which is bizarre. And that's where, I, you know, interestingly enough, that's where I wanted to go to go next, maybe not to specifically to currency, but to maybe the belief systems that you are seeing in, uh, in the U.S. and American society that may not be in line with what we've been talking about. Because I believe these universal truths are, you know, are, are evident in a lot of different respects, a lot of different successful societies. But in our, in our day and age, you know, I, I see a lot of uh, fr- the fragileness associated with, uh, with markets, with interest rates. But I think that it, it really starts with the American society's belief system or perspective when it comes to how things should operate. So what would, what would you say are maybe some of those fragile points that you see that American society is adopting as their belief system? Well, the biggest problem, and you alluded to it earlier, is that people don't understand how the system works. And again, you got a lot of these young entrepreneurs that became rich, but they don't understand why they became rich and how they could do that in the U.S. But they couldn't do it in Venezuela. And you can have the same person, uh, the same genetic structure, come from a good family in both countries. In one place, you're stuck. You have to get out. There's no, there's no way to do anything. And then you can come to the U.S. and do most everything. I had a, 
30 years ago, I was very much involved in the economic transition in Eastern Europe in the former Soviet Union. And what struck me is when I started working in these countries, are all these very smart, young entrepreneurial pe people, but they couldn't do anything in their own country. And they had to get out, and many of them came to the US or Europe, other places, but particularly coming to the US. And um, well, I was, and particularly I had worked in Bulgaria, and Bulgaria now is a, a very free market country, and I noticed that the Index of Economic Freedom, it's in the, it's in the top uh, quintile now. But years ago, it wasn't. And for a Bulgarian to succeed, it was much easier to leave the country. And so you had all these young Bulgarians who would come to the US, get an education. And I used to say, why don't you go back to Bulgaria and help the country? And say, well, it's hopeless. I'll stay here. And a lot of them became quite wealthy, some of them who worked for me. And uh, I thought, well, you know, I, I sort of realized that, of course, they made the right decision. And then Bulgaria changed, and they're, they're the first ones to put a 10% flat tax in. And they had a lot of corruption, but they've gotten rid of much, much of it. And it's a remarkably different place now because they started adopting the rules that work every place. And again, these rules, well, we take Chile. Uh, Chile, I think, is now the 13th most free country in the world. 40 years ago, it was a Marxist dictatorship. It was horrible. I mean, it, just, it was a, a communist country. Uh, hadn't been that long. A guy named Allende, at the time of the communist dictator, mm -hmm. he was overthrown. And it took them a number of years to get a really a democratic government. But they started the economic reform quite early. And now you go to uh, Chile, San Diego. And it reminds me so much of the way California used to be before California went downhill. I mean, it's beautiful. It's got the same climate, you know, near San Diego's like Southern California. It's, uh, it's the, the mountains come up from the sea and beautiful beaches and just, it's gorgeous and the, the vineyards and they grow most everything. And you see that change where a country, again, was a poor Marxist dictatorship and now is the wealthiest country in South America. Same people, only thing that was different is the systems. So if you, what I find fascinating is polarity oftentimes gives you a different perspective. When, you, when you've experienced what it's like to have a dictatorship, I think the value that's placed on freedom is so much, it's so much greater. And I look at how I characterize the perspective of the United States is we don't have polarity. We've had freedom. We've had success. We've had an infrastructure for so long that people have discounted its nature and subsequently now are, are questioning its, uh, its danger. Do you, do you see the same thing or, or maybe something different? No, I think you put your finger on it. We look at what's happening in Hong Kong right now. The people who are the citizens of Hong Kong are, uh, most of them are the descendants of people who came over in the late 40s, 1950s and things from China. Uh, if they didn't directly experience communism, their parents or grandparents did. They know what it's all about. You don't have to explain it to them. And you look at how they're risking everything. They're unarmed, and every weekend, every night, they go out there and are protesting uh, what may seem like fairly minor issues, but they're not because they understand that once they start to lose some of these things, there is a slippery slope, and they'll end up looking like China rather than Hong Kong. And um, you can see they, they don't want to go back. And uh, I worry about the situation, but the fact that these people have this courage, again, without any um, weapons or anything, but just go out there and confront the authorities night after night after night and demand to keep the freedoms that were given to them on the uh, basic agreement between the British and Chinese, the 50 year agreement. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, that fighting, again, the fighting again comes from that, that understanding of what it's like to have the, uh, the opposite. And obviously their you know, neighbor is China. Now, if you look at, you know, with, uh, with regards to one of the 
those universal fundamentals that you had mentioned. I know that you have some experience here, which is which is currency, a sound a sound monetary system. And I look at you know what's going on in in our country, and we've benefited from from so much. Yet at the same time, there's a great cause for concern with with uh, the deficit spending, with uh, the you know, future obligations of Medicare and Social Security, and the way in which that is operating. And and you had some uh, I know communications with a lot of the the Silicon Valley folks that were looking at you know internal payment systems associated with you know cryptocurrency or blockchain and figuring out new ways in order to uh, to make exchanges, which would not only uh, create more efficiency with exchange, but would ultimately reduce the the central influence and power around that type of exchange. Would you mind speaking to that? Um, no, uh, central banks, <coughs> excuse me, uh, central banks are relatively recent phenomena and they're actually going to be a short lived phenomena. Um, from about 1870 to 1914, the world was on the gold standard, which is the great era of monetary stability around the world because all the major countries were on the gold standard which meant nobody could control the price of money. It was, it was supply and demand, and it worked extremely well. There was no um, exchange fees between countries because, you know, a, uh, an ounce of gold in, in London was the same as New York or Tokyo or wherever. And um, it worked well, and the reason it fell apart is because when they went to the First World War, the countries need to borrow a whole lot to engage in war. And under the gold standard, you have limit to how much you can borrow, and uh, which should have constrained war, but in fact, it, it, they destroyed the money and engaged in war. So we look today, um, we have these, they call fiat currencies. Uh, the US dollar really has backing. The US dollar is the world's currency. And the backing the, the US dollar has is the ability of the government to tax, take real resources, uh, take things uh, that have real value that we all own and take them at the point of the gun and, uh, and seize them. Um, and they try to manage the value of the dollar. We're seeing they can do this less and less well. Open market operations that some of your listeners who had courses in economics uh, learned about some of the tools that the Fed had. Uh, most of these tools are far less potent than they used to be and are hardly used anymore. Uh, and so the goal, I, I, well, I should back up. I was a great fan of Hayek, the great Nobel Prize uh, economist philosopher, F.A. Hayek. In 1976, he wrote a book called Denationalization of Money. I was a young economist at the time, and I was fascinated by the book. And I was an advisor to one of the commodity exchanges at the time, also teaching. And I thought, well, he's really nailed it. But mechanically, it was sort of hard to do. This would be before the modern computer digital age. And uh, I wrote a lot about it and played with it, of how we could actually do it. And then in 1998, I guess was I wrote a book called The End of Money, looking at digital money and so forth. And eventually, of course, 10 years ago, the blockchain came along with uh, uh, you know, the first of the, uh, with Bitcoin and the early cyber currencies. So the, the question is, where is all this leading? And to start with the basic goal would be to have a worldwide monetary standard which would make trade and investment very easy around the world. With these big uh, fluctuating exchange rates, think if you were a German chemical manufacturer and the price of the uh, euro, which the Germans use, goes up and down considerably against the dollar. Um, do you put your plant in Louisiana? Do you put it in Hamburg, Germany? Do you put it someplace else? And uh, and if you make a mistake because you've misgaged, uh, misgaged where the, uh, the exchange rate will be, and nobody knows this for certain, 
this can be extremely costly to us. You can have windfalls or often great penalties. Um, if you had a constant currency throughout the world that everybody used, um, that problem goes away. And uh, a lot of these investment decisions, which are almost difficult to make, basically disappear. And you'll put your money where it makes the most sense given, again, raw materials and markets and so forth. And that is the great promise of the cryptocurrency digital age. So then you have a debate of what should be behind a cryptocurrency. And with Bitcoin, it's nothing but on a computer algorithm. And they kept the scarcity by the system they have, and you have to mine the new ones that have increasing costs. And uh, they have, well, I guess it's 21 million. Um, but it, there's nothing sort of real there. And I always fear that someday somebody will actually figure out how to hack it. Nobody has to date, but things can go wrong. Or you have a meltdown of the uh, rural electronic system for some period of time. Won't be permanent, but you know, these, you see these science fiction things and not, not all of them science fiction of the electrical grids going down and so forth. Well, if a currency has nothing more than a computer algorithm behind it, you'll have many more problems than I think are necessary. A lot of people recognize this problem. They're trying to do cryptocurrencies, but have real backing like with gold or silver, traditional precious metals. But these are heavily regulated. And I've argued that you can use uh, almost any standard commodity, things that are traded in organized futures markets around the world, uh, where we've had the standards for a good long while. And in fact, I and a few others have created a company which we will do a, an aluminum backed uh, cryptocurrency. Now, that may sound ridiculous because aluminum is inexpensive, it's found everywhere, but it has a number of great advantages. It's never going to be worth zero. And we're not talking about carrying around aluminum coins in your pocket. I mean, gold's important for that if you want to carry it around. But in a digital age, you can have the aluminum stored any place and still trade it and still use it. Anyway, I think this is the way we're moving. And I've been putting my money and time where my mouth is on the whole thing. And it'll be interesting to see how this works out. I mean, you've got a, a thousand different experiments going on around the world at this time and any given time. So. No, I, you know, Richard, one of the, the conversations we had when we were in, uh, were in Belize was around uh, an idea that you had regarding uh, how to essentially create some sort of ETF or fund around the, uh, the, the natural resources of Belize and what that could potentially do, right, to back their, back their currency. So it sounds very, in a, in a similar way, what you're, what you're talking about right now, having something that backs a cryptocurrency. What I was talking about there was a, a standard currency board. I used to be on the board of the Cayman Island Monetary Authority, and I've got a currency board there, the Cayman dollars fixed to the U.S. dollar. And so those are sort of board, we manage that. It was easy just at a fixed exchange rate. Years beforehand, I'd done some work in Estonia, and they had a number of natural resources. And after the, the Estonians were trying to figure out how to establish new money, and they had some gold in the Bank of England and the Fed in New York, and they had a lot of timber and oil shale and so forth. And they were able to put together a currency board, which gave total backing for our currency. It wasn't cryptocurrency, it was just a, uh, a normal currency at the time. And the currency boards, I have been, a lot of them have been set up in Eastern Europe with the former communist countries. And they work very well for uh, sort of mid-sized countries because they get the the monetary production outside the political process, like Bulgaria has got one, and it's basically fixed to the euro. So um, Bulgaria can inflate its way out of problems. This caused Bulgaria to have a, actually a very good fiscal policy. Before they had the currency board, they went through a couple episodes of hyperinflation. Mm. And back when I chaired the transition project, Back in 1990, I argued for a currency board then, but they had to go through these bouts of inflation before uh, I remember I got a call one day and said, Richard, you know that idea you had for a currency board? Maybe we're ready for it. And that was 1997. 
has worked very well since. Well, that's the polarity idea, right? It, where ideas and solutions uh, could could be valid, but if that's the only thing that a person sees, then you know it it may not be relevant at the time. But when they go through some sort of a crisis and experience not having it uh, or something like that that could have prevented it, that's when they value it more. And that's I would say one of the you know maybe last things we can uh, talk about before uh, before we end of this fascinating conversation is. You know, just where where we stand, you know, with the the, the fragile nature of uh, potentially a, America and what we experience. I know we have a lot of strength in so many different uh, areas, but do you do you do you look at where we're at as a as a society and identify one uh, one part of it or a couple parts of it that are more fragile than others? Yes, I mean the big, the most fragile part is this notion of getting stuff for free. And the idea that you can have free medical care and free pensions and so forth, and these don't have to be actuarially sound. And that always ends up a disaster every place in the world has ever tried. And it's like these people, when I listen to these debates, it's like people have read no history. I mean, it's, it's quite astounding to me that they think they can just do this. I mean, some of the cr- crazy things, Bernie Sanders comes out, when it's like the Soviet Union and all of the other places never existed, or, or and maybe in his mind they worked perfectly. For those of us who had been there, no, that was not true. It, it impoverished everybody. Um, but we look at uh, Social Security now. We have to make adjustments to the system as we age as a society. When uh, Social Security was first developed in the 1930s. There are about 12 working Americans for each person in Social Security. Now we have about three, and that that ratio will continue to decline. And as people start living to uh, a commonplace, 100, 110, 120, or whatever, and uh, you can't have people retired for half their lives and have a good retirement income, uh, somebody has to actually be doing the work. And they said, well, we'll increase the taxes. But the more you increase the taxes, uh, that discourages work. And you get out of yourself on these uh, treadmills, and it's a formula for disaster. We're seeing it play out in places in Europe now. And uh, Japan and other places are in worse shape than the U.S. Um, over the last few years, we see it play out in Greece. And the average Greek has a, a per capita income of about, 30% less than they did six, seven years ago. That's a huge drop in the standard of living. And the idea is they were going to spend money that they weren't earning. And you can only do that up to a point. And at some point, people say, I'm not going to loan you anymore. And when that happens, the game is over. And that's what I fear in this country. On the socialized health systems, we've seen plenty of those around the world. And you get, tend to get inferior care, queuing, and then they always end up with two sets. I mean, I look at Britain, a lot of other places, there is a medical system for the people who are wealthy or willing to pay uh, for their own, which is pretty good. It has decent hospitals and state of the art. And then there's the medical care for their, everybody else that's, quote, free. But it's like the VA system. Do you really want to go there? And one of the great changes the Trump administration made is now people, the VA, have a choice. You can either go to the VA or go to your own doctor. If you call the VA and they say, well, we can't see you for six months, you go to your own doctor. And they just send the bill over to the VA, which is a much better system. Well, it, it, I kind of refer to what's going on sometimes as uh, it's like psychological warfare, because it seems that you know, rational thinking has been thrown out the door and it's, you know, demagoguery and and rhetoric that has taken over and it's the hot buttons, it's the trigger buttons that, you know, force people, not force them, but ultimately get people to react emotionally. And, and when that exists, you know, you throw rationale out the window because, you know, history has shown what some of the things that are being proposed have done to societies, but yet history and reason really have nothing to do with the conversation anymore, it seems. Well, um, no, I, I thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak to your audience. Well, why don't you, because you're still active and you are still, 
uh, writing. Why don't you tell people about what you're doing with the uh, the uh, the Washington Times and uh, and other you know other ways in which people can uh, follow you and keep up to speed with what you're talking about? Well, I do a column which is published each week every Tuesday morning in the Washington Times. I've done that for 20 years, and you can find it on the Washington Times website or the Institute for Global Economic Growth dot org dot org. Mm -hmm. And, okay, I think you've got all the information on that. And it's, it appears a lot of other places. But worst comes to worst, you just Google in my name and uh, you'll find, or it's on Twitter, Facebook, you'll find uh, 2,000 columns by me of, and uh, my ideas of the week. So. Well, Richard, it's been a pleasure. And we'll make sure that all of those links are uh, in the show notes so that people can go uh, to our website and find uh, and find you. But thank you so much for your time. It's been, it's been an awesome, uh, awesome conversation. I really appreciate it. I've learned a lot. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. Take care.